You know, a lot of times when we think about the Bible, we think about it as being this long, long time ago, and how in the world can we relate to anything that happened 2,000 plus years ago? Well, it's interesting when we actually take a look at Scripture, we actually begin to look into history about what things were like. So when Jesus showed up 2,000 years ago, the world that he lived in was massively divided. They were divided over everything and anything you could possibly think of. There was divisions among families. There was divisions among people upon the political sphere. There was divisions in religion. It was ridiculous. In fact, there was political unrest. If you're not familiar with this, the Roman Empire had overtaken most of the world, and they were the ones that were ruling the, the Jewish people at that point in time. And so if you were a Jewish person, you fit into one of three categories. The first category is you were a zealot, right? You were a zealot. You hated the Roman Empire and you did everything you could to try to undermine and attack, even to the point of violence. There were these groups of people that would literally attack soldiers and attack different things because they wanted to overthrow the Roman Empire. And then there was this kind of, this middle group, they were the sympathizers, they're like, you know what? We're just going to go along to get along. You know people like that, right? They're like, we're going to ripple any waters. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, there were the collaborators, the ones that were working with the Roman government to, to be able to take money from people, to be able to keep people you know, suppressed. They were the people that would whisper names into the ears of the Roman people so that they could get other people arrested. And so people were divided along these political lines. There was also religious disagreement. If you've been in church at all, you've probably heard the name of a group of people called the Pharisees. And they were the, they were the like seriously right, okay? I guess that's my right, your right over here. They were the seriously right group of political people, right? They were the right wingers and they, everything was tradition and then they added all this extra stuff to it. And then you had the common people that were just like, well, you know, okay, sometimes I go to temple, sometimes I don't. And then you had this other group over here that were the Sadducees. Now the Sadducees, were kind of like religious, but they used religion in a secular way to try to get things the way that they wanted to get them. And the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they hated each other. They wanted nothing to do with each other. And so depending upon which side of the argument you came down, you know, maybe you wouldn't be invited to Passover dinner this year because all of a sudden you're a Sadducee person. Then there was educational upheaval. So the Jewish form of education is very different from the Greek model that the Romans brought in. The Jewish form was they would train you and you would have to physically do it and perform it and act it out to, to know whether or not you've learned it. The Greek form is what we know kind of today as our education system. Did you memorize it? Can you regurgitate it? Can you put it on a piece of paper? And so if you were a parent, you had a choice. You could take them to the Jewish synagogue or the temple to get trained, or you could take them to regular Hellenistic or Greek schools. And it's kind of like, to me, I kind of liken it to the homeschool, private school, public school thing. And you know, you're like, well, I can't believe that you would take your kids. And it's like, come on, just, just chill, all right? And that's all this stuff. All this stuff was happening at this day. And then, of course, there's financial insecurity as well. I mean, the taxes were just so massive on the Jewish culture that their economy was incredibly depressed and there was all sorts of problems. So they had political unrest, they had religious disagreements, they had financial insecurity, they, <clears throat> excuse me, they had educational disagreements. Does it sound familiar at all? Right? We think it's so different. But the reality is, is that the world that Jesus stepped into was just as much in need of rescuing as our world today. But when Jesus showed up, he didn't say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create this whole new political structure because politics are always the answer. We're going to create this whole new educational system. He didn't even say, we're going to create this whole new religious thing. The answer was simply, here I am. The answer was Jesus. He says, listen, you want, you want the answer to all the solutions? You want the solution to all the, all the questions that you ask? It's me. And Jesus says this in John chapter 10, verses 8 through 11. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. He says, listen, everything that you thought 
was going to help you, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Everything you thought was going to help you and make your life better, and do all, all that stuff, all that does is it actually robs from you. It takes from you. It doesn't give you anything. Everything that came before me, they were all thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. You're like, what does this have to do with me? He's equating us to sheep, okay? Now, some of you are like, oh, sheep. They're furry and they're cute and they're fluffy and they're stupid. <laughs> no, seriously. Have you seen the video where the shepherd comes and he like pulls the sheep out of the big crack in the middle of the world and he lets the sheep loose and the sheep's like, ah, and it turns around and jumps right back in the hole. That is what Jesus is comparing us to. And can we be honest? It's pretty accurate. Okay. He says, they will come and go freely and find good pastures. The thief's purpose, the people that come before me, is to steal and to kill and to destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Jesus says, listen, everything else that came before me, everything else that is out there that you can tend to put your hope in, that you tend to believe in, that you think is going to deliver you, that you think is going to elevate the world and make everything better, every one of them will let us down, including the people in our lives. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. How many of you have had people in your life let you down? Because it may be the person sitting next to you. Because everybody will let us down and everything will let us down. Those things were never intended to save us. Now, it's not that they're not necessary, because most of those good things we're going to talk about are, are, are necessary and they're good things, but they were never intended to free us and give us the life that God has for us. And anytime they try, they always fall short and they end up robbing you. Let me give you an example. Let's, let, let's, let's start with this first one, okay? Government. Everybody loves government, right? Yeah, no, thank you, <laughs> right? So here's the thing, government, government attempts to mandate goodness. They do. Government attempts or tries to mandate goodness. But here's what happens. They end up controlling your life. So government says, listen, this is a bad thing. So let's make a law so that nobody can do this. And so you ever noticed that laws are made for the dumbest of us? You ever, you ever thought about that? Laws are just made for the dumbest of us. Let me give you an example. I, if you want to like, just have some fun this week, uh, get on Google and, and, and do dumb laws in the United States. I did that this week, and I want to share with you what I learned. First of all, uh, I know we have some Alabama people here. <laughs> Alabama, hey, that's right. Right, Alabama. Now, Alabama made the final four, so good for them, right? They're going to need it because, um, you know, Nick Saban left, and so they're all crying. But listen, Alabama, here's, here's a legit law still in the books from Alabama. You cannot chain your pet alligator to the fire hydrant. <laughs> Sorry, Brandon. You cannot chain your pet alligator to the fire hydrant. Now, my question is, why is there a law saying you cannot have a pet alligator. But nonetheless, you cannot chain your, your, your pet alligator. Now, now, Arkansas, which is very close to and similar to Alabama, not to be outdone, says, okay, but alligators cannot be held in bathtubs. Right? So those of you that have them in the Alabama, you know, Arkansas bathtubs, you know, you're good to go. Now, Colorado, by the way, one of the very first states that legalized weed, so this shouldn't surprise us. The dog catcher must notify dogs. The dog catcher must notify dogs of pending impoundment by posting for three consecutive days a notice on a tree in the park and along the public road that runs through said park. Okay, so... Now, Connecticut, they don't necessarily, they're not worried about impounding your pets, but they are concerned about a canine uprising because in Connecticut, you are not allowed to educate your dogs. In Illinois, our brothers to the, to the west and the north of us, it is illegal for anyone 
to give lighted cigars, they say nothing about cigarettes, by the way, lighted cigars to your dogs or your cats or other domesticated animals. So if you're sitting on your deck and you're enjoying a nice stogie, maybe a Macanudo, and you're just sitting there and your dog comes out and looks like they might want to puff, <laughs> you, you can't do that. Indiana, however, is really worried about cigarettes. In Indiana, still on the books, look it up. In Indiana, it is illegal not to give, but to make a monkey smoke a cigarette. <laughs> I'm unaware that there were that many monkeys in Indiana that we had to make a law about that. But apparently in 1924, a monkey was convicted a monkey, not the pet owner, but the monkey, was convicted in South Bend of the crime of smoking a cigarette and was sentenced to pay a $25 fine and the trial costs. So the law is born. Now, you know, any list of dumb laws would not be complete if we didn't share one from Kentucky. There were a lot to choose from. Those of you from Kentucky, we, we love you, but I don't know if you know this or not. It's, it's illegal for you to marry the same man more than three times. <laughs> Especially if it's your uncle. No, it's just, <laughs> I just... I added that part. That's, that's not in there. Now, believe it or not, all of these laws at one point in time made sense to someone somewhere. They wouldn't be laws. In fact... You had to have a majority of people actually say, yeah, that's a good idea. We shouldn't allow monkeys to smoke cigarettes. I mean, that could, all hell could break loose if we did that. And so what happens is every time government tries to mandate goodness, all they do is end up controlling your life. Well, government's not the only one. Religion is just as bad. In fact, quite frankly, they may be worse because religion, religion tries to guide us to God. You see, religion religion's not Christianity. R religion is man's attempt to lay out rules and, and steps that you take so that you can find God. And so religion, we think about, it, well, that's a good thing, right? It lays out steps. But what happens is, is that as religion tries to guide us to God, what it ends up doing is then ends up standing in the way of God. It ends up creating barriers between people and God. Because what, what, what goes on is that people begin to create rules. Right? Because that's what religion is. Religion is rules. And so they begin to come up with these rules to kind of structure and force people to kind of go through a particular path to get to God. And they come up with really great things like, like tests to figure out whether or not you're of the right religious stripe. Like what translation of the Bible do you use? Because if you weren't saved with this translation of the Bible, then you probably really aren't saved. It's got to be old school so you don't have any idea what's actually being read. Or maybe it's things like what kind of music? What kind of music do you play? Do you have drums? Because drums, I'm pretty sure that's a, that's a beat from the devil and that's a bad thing. Or, or if you don't have drums, well, what's wrong with you? you know? Don't you love Jesus? And so they create these things. And then, then we get into the really deep theological issues. Now, what I'm going to share with you, some of you are like, that's so silly. I grew up hearing this. You ready? The deep theological issues like, should men have facial hair? Or is it really sinful to men for men to have facial hair? All the guys in here with beards are like, I hope not. Because I like 14 without my beard. Or the even deeper theological question, can women wear jeans? Some probably shouldn't wear spandex, but, <laughs> but jeans, those are probably okay. These, these are the type of things that happens, right? When religion starts coming up with these rules, all they do is they stand in the way of actually getting to God. Now, we have some unbelievable educators here, and so I'm going to tread on this carefully because, you know, religion tries to guide us to God but ends up standing in the way, and government tries to mandate goodness but ends up trying to control your life. Well, education, it, it doesn't get absolved because here's what happens, right? If you trust in education to try to fix it, everything, what happens is education tries to illuminate your mind, right? 
to open your mind and open your horizons and, and broaden your way of thinking, none of which are bad. But what ends up happening is that as you soak your brain in all of this education, it ends up clouding your ability to see God. You go, well, I don't know, that sounds kind of funny. Have you ever met someone that was too smart for their own good? They're so brilliant, but they can't tie their own shoes. Ever noticed that at MIT, most of the people have Velcro shoes? I'm just saying, just, just something to think about there. You get so smart, and here's what happens. The more intelligence you have, the more you think about stuff. And I'm, listen, I, listen, get a, get a degree. I think we should have educators that love Jesus all over the place. It's the greatest thing in the world. But if you trust in education to fix everything, it'll just end up clouding because what happens is, is you begin to overanalyze everything. And the more you overanalyze, the less you'll actually do. So it clouds our ability to see and make those things. So religion, paralysis by analysis, government, education, all of these different things. Here's, here's the last one we tend to put our hope and faith in. It's money. Because all this other stuff, you're like, right, okay, okay. But if I had enough money, if I had enough money, I could solve all my problems. Anybody here go, man, I wish I had some more money, right? And then, okay, cool. Those of you that don't have your hands raised, you're like, let's talk afterwards. Because you got enough. Let's talk. Because like, man, if I just had enough money, but here's what happens. Money, money tries to buy your freedom, but it ends up owning your soul. You ever met somebody that pursued money so hard that they ended up actually being a slave to the money itself? They became trapped by the pursuit of more. And this little thing called greed begins to crop up and they want more and more and more. And pretty soon the pursuit of money consumes them. Government can't free you. It'll just seek to control you. Religion can't free you. It just ends up standing in the way. Education can't free you. It'll just cloud your mind and make you overanalyze everything. And money, money can't free you because it will consume your soul. Only Jesus can free you. Only Jesus will truly set you free. Jesus literally died not to control you, not to confuse you, not to stand in your way, but to release you. Remember that verse we read at the beginning of John 10, 10? And that little part of it, it says, my purpose, the reason I came, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I want you to just take a pause for a moment. And I want you to be honest with yourself right now. If I said, would you categorize your life for me? Would you give your life a, a title or a topic or a theme? Would rich and satisfying be any part of it? Jesus said, I came so that you can have a rich and satisfying life, that yet most people run around with life ragged and trying to figure out what they're supposed to do next. And I would guess, just based on knowing many of you, that, that most of you aren't, aren't hardened killers. Most of you. Most of you probably work a, a steady job and maybe you even have a 401k and some savings and, and a house. You probably got a big mortgage on it, but you got a house and probably some cars. Maybe your kids even like you. And you're like, okay, I've got a good life, but I don't know that I would call it rich and satisfying. I don't know that I would say I'm completely fulfilled. I don't know that I would say I wake up every morning excited about what my day might hold because I'm ready to take those next steps. I, I, I don't know that I would categorize it that way. What's the problem? The problem is we're trusting in the wrong thing. Although many of those things, you know, government, government can be good. Religion, not a bad thing. Education can be good. Money can be good. Nothing wrong with those things. But none of those things were meant to lead us to a rich and satisfying life. Jesus says in John 14, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
And no one can come to the Father except through me. There's no other way. You go, well, yeah, but no. there's no other way. Every other way leads to you feeling like you've been robbed, you've been betrayed, you've been left out because none of the other ones were meant to do that. You go, yeah, okay, but I've tried all this other stuff. What's the guarantee that Jesus will actually do what he says he will do? That's Easter. That's what Easter is all about. Easter is the signature moment, if you will, of Jesus Christ. It was Easter that he proved he would do everything he said he would do. It was Easter that solidified God's purpose on this earth. Jesus' resurrection is the proof. It is the guarantee that he will do exactly what he says he will do. In fact, that was the very first message that was ever preached after the resurrection of Jesus Christ some 2,000 years ago. It was about six weeks after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul stood up and the entire city of Jerusalem kind of gathered around because there was this noise, there was this stuff that happened and they all came to see what it was. And Peter walks out and he begins to preach to this group of people that just six weeks before had watched everything take place. And so if there was ever any group of people that could go, You guys are nuts. We saw it all happen. Jesus isn't alive. Jesus wasn't resurrected. Jesus wasn't even a real person. Jesus didn't die. Jesus didn't do any of that stuff. It was these people. These people were eyewitnesses. They had the front row seat. They had seen it all. They had experienced it all. They were part of the crowd that shouted, crucify him. When Pilate brought him up and was trying to set Jesus free. They watched with their own eyes as as Jesus was brutally whipped and as he was forced to carry the cross to the city. They spat on him because they hated him. They threw things at him and rocks and probably rotten fruit and everything else and made fun of him and jeered him. They watched as he was nailed to the cross and put in the ground. They heard him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They felt the earth shake. They saw the, the world go dark for three hours. They listened as Jesus breathed his last words, it is finished. And Jesus was put in the tomb and nothing happened. Day two rolled around. Nothing happened. Day three breaks and rumors begin to spread through the city. You ever, you ever been in a friend group? It's easier now on Facebook and Instagram. Everybody knows what everybody's doing all the time. You ever been in a friend group like before that stuff and something happened and you begin to hear the rumors like, did you really do that? That's what's happening all throughout the city of Jerusalem. They say Jesus' tomb is empty. They go to the tomb, the tomb that was sealed by Pilate and had guards standing in front. The tomb is open. The guards are gone. The tomb is empty. He's really not there. We fast forward because not only does Jesus actually rise from the dead, but he appears to people over the next 40 days and at one point in time preached to a crowd of over 400 people. It was to these people that Peter spoke these words just six weeks after those events in Acts chapter 2. God raised Jesus from the dead and we are all witnesses of this. Now, If you were part of that group and you saw Jesus die, but you're like, dude, the tomb is still sealed. The guards are still there. He is not risen. You'd be like, okay, Peter, whatever you're smoking from Colorado, continue on because we're out of here, man. We're out of here. You're nuts. But nobody even says a word. He continues. Now he is exalted to the place of the highest honor in heaven at God's right hand and the Father as he had promised. He always keeps his word. And gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon you as you have seen and heard today. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, and I love this, whom you crucified. They were the same people shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and our children. They were shouting it. And now he's looking at them and saying, who you crucified. 
that this Jesus is both Lord and the Messiah. Now, if they didn't see it, if they didn't believe it, if they weren't there, what do you think their response would be? Y'all are nuts. You know what their response was? The Bible says their hearts were pierced and they cried out together in unison, brothers, what must we do? What do we do to make this right? And Peter's response is so powerful. He says, you know what you need to do? You need to turn from your sin and you need to turn to God and you need to follow Jesus Christ because just like he said, everything that came before was just a thief and a robber and it steals everything from you. And you might go, well, why would God care? Why would God care to do that? Well, because in a conversation that Jesus had with a doubter whose name was Nicodemus, Nicodemus said, how is this all possible? And Jesus' first response is a verse you've probably heard before. It's John 3, 16. Are you familiar with that? He says, for God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son that whoever would believe in him will not perish but have eternal life, which is a cool verse, and we love it. If you've ever been to a sports place or you've been to an event, you probably saw it on a bed sheet, right, somewhere, John 3, 16. But it's really cool because Jesus doesn't stop there. The next verse, he says this, for the Son of God, did not come into the world to condemn it, but to save it. That's why he cares. His purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. His purpose was to pay for all of your sins, to give you the opportunity to have a relationship with God and to set you free. That's why he came. And Easter puts the exclamation point and proof that he'll keep his word. Only Jesus will set you free. The question is, will you let him? That's really what it all boils down to. Listen, I don't care where you've come from. I don't care what your background is. So, well, you don't know me. You're right. I don't. But God does. And God said he loves you so much that he willingly paid the price for all of your failures, all of your flaws, all of your issues. And we're all hot messes. Every one of us. And we all need Jesus. And only Jesus will set you free. So in just a moment, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to invite you today to do two things, to turn from whatever it is you've been believing in to fix your problems, whether it's government or money or education or yourself or other people or your job or your, your, your you know, professional appearance or your ego, whatever, whatever it is you think that's going to save you. The Bible says we need to turn away from that and we need to turn to God. So we're just going to pray, and you can pray right where you are. You don't need to get up and move. Listen, that's, that's religion. This is, oh, you got to get up. you got to come to the front. Show. No, 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 no. This is between you and God, right where you are. So would you bow with me? Father God, we thank you so much. We're absolutely honored that you would choose to come not to condemn but to set us free. So God, this morning, for every man or woman that's here today who's heard this and gone, okay, that's, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to follow Jesus. Just in the quietness of this moment, if you would pray in your hearts and your minds along with me something like this, dear God, I choose to believe. I choose to follow you so that I can experience true life. I turn away from all the things that I think would make it right. And I turn to the one who already has made it right. And I accept Jesus and as best as I know how choose to live my life in pursuit of him. For those of you who are here today that maybe you, maybe you were a Christian a long time ago, you accepted Jesus Christ, but you've kind of 
Maybe you were burned by religion, you were burned by a church, you were burned by circumstances, or you're mad at God because of things that have happened. You've lost someone you've loved, you've gone through a trial, a struggle, and you've doubted that God truly loves you. I pray that today, first of all, you would feel that love, you would experience that love. If you're like, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to, to turn my life back around and, and give Jesus another chance. I pray right where you are, you would pray with me something like this. Dear God, I'm choosing to follow you. I believe in you. Help where my belief falls short. Whether it's because of circumstances or hurt, anger or pride. Help me where I fall short so I can follow you. Father, for every person that's here today, I pray that as we respond, we would just respond singing to you. We would celebrate the power of the name of Jesus Christ who breaks every stronghold. And God, that every prayer that we pray is founded on an empty grave. Because Easter, Easter seals the deal. Easter proves your promise and it fills us with hope and resurrection and fresh starts and new beginnings. And God, we celebrate that with you just like those 3,000 plus people did 2,000 years ago and said, yes, we choose to believe. Father, I thank you so much for that. I pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.